The fire safety industry is quickly transitioning away from fluorinated foam products. In this episode of Solutions That Save, two experts from Perimeter Solutions discuss how different segments of the industry are handling the transition and what impact a new regulation expected to be introduced at the end of the year could have on fluorine-free technology. That and more on today's episode of Solutions That Save, a fire safety podcast from Perimeter Solutions. Hello, I'm your host, Dan Green. Welcome to Solutions That Save, a fire safety podcast from Perimeter Solutions, helping save property, natural resources, critical infrastructure, and lives. In today's episode, Craig McDonald, General Manager of Fire Suppression for the Americas at Perimeter Solutions, sits down with Perimeter Solutions Business Development Lead and Chemist, Mark Seen. The two discuss the state of fluorine-free foam technology, the company's first fluorine-free 1x3 product, and wrap up with a look into the future of fire suppression technology. Let's join the conversation. Uh, this is uh, Craig McDonald. I'm the general manager with Perimeter Solutions. And today, Mark and I will be discussing the transition away from fluorinated products to fluorine-free foam. As we all know, the fluorinated products have been the workhorse in the industry and legislation and corporate policies are now starting to drive this change. And I wanted to spend some time today with you, Mark, and have you walk us through what you're seeing from the chemist's point of view and some of the technical challenges that we're facing. And so I thought maybe we'd start by having you share a little bit about your background and your career at Perimeter Solutions. All right. Thanks, Craig. I graduated from Michigan State with a degree in human biology in, in 2007. And I have hopped on with a local company as a chemical technician in R&D, but I spent most of my time doing fire testing and product approvals. I really enjoyed the science and the problem solving associated with it. So I decided to pick up a few extra credits to uh, get a chemistry degree also while continuing to work full time. Uh, I spent the next few years developing formulations for both fluorinated and fluorine free products. And a few months back, I took the opportunity where I could go out and talk about the products that we've developed over the past few years and uh, also learn a little bit about the business side. As you're well aware, the fluorine-free foams are are trying to replace products that are tried and true in the marketplace, and there certainly are some challenges. I thought maybe you could just talk a little bit about, from a high-level perspective, when you're developing fluorine-free foam solutions and trying to replace these products that have been around since the 1960s, maybe a little high-level view of how you think that's going. Sure. I like to compare this transition time that we're in to uh, the wild, wild west. After 50 years of uh, the industry developing fluorinated products, you know, the quality of the products, you know, ha- has, has gotten better and better over the years uh, between the main manufacturers. Right now with fluorine free products, there are a few ways to develop them. You could use specialty polymers, some silicone surfactants, and some combinations of both. So over the next five to 10 years, the technology will start developing and many of the manufacturers lean towards a similar technology, uh, which will make it a little bit easier to uh, make the progression in terms of performance. As for fluorine-free products, completely replacing fluorinated products, that may take a little bit of time because the performance of the fluorinated products now has been built over the last 50 years of innovation. And we are, in essence, trying to do all that work that's been done over the last 50 years in 10% of the time. Um, So it's been pretty difficult on our end, but we're making pretty good improvements as we go. Um, There are applications that fluorine-free foam can be used instead of fluorinated foam, but there's still work that needs to be done to complete uh, the removal of the uh, fluorinated products in terms of performance. This development is almost a mirror image of what went on with fluorinated products. You know, at one point, fluorinated products started out with alcohol-type concentrates that were six-by-nines. Mm-hmm. eventually moved to six by six, right? And three by three, and then one by ones. Yeah, We're seeing a lot of the same stuff with fluorine free. Let's start with the municipal market. And what challenges do you see from developing products that meet their needs? So I like to look at it in kind of two groups. You've got the municipal only and the municipal and industrial, because there are some uh, fire departments out there that provide mutual aid for the industries in their area. So what they're going to need is going to be a little bit different than the strictly municipal groups. So, you know, the transition for the municipal groups over to fluorine free foam, based on what they see in terms of structural fires, uh, vehicle fires, and other types of small scenarios, 
uh, they're able to make that switch over uh, with the products that are out there now. Uh, it's really when you get to the the combination group of uh, municipal firefighters that also respond with mutual aid to uh, large industrial complexes and uh, chemical plants that they could have you know a wider range of chemicals there. Um, they could have a you know a large three hundred foot diameter tank, which you know the products that are used for putting out a car fire or a small dumpster fire are a lot different than that that's needed for a three hundred foot diameter tank. So, so it's pretty different in, in terms of what each group would need. Do you think it's fair to say that the industrial fire departments end up having applications where they do more fuel in depth scenarios and the, and the product? that ends up getting put on on these types of fires ends up plunging into the fuel? Yep, that's safe to say for sure. The industrial guys will see a lot more than that. And really when it comes time to what the municipal and industrial guys will see, my longtime mentor had the best answer for that where it says it depends. I mean, it could be anywhere on the spectrum in terms of the fire that needs to be fought, but it's really going to rely heavily on the pre-planning and uh, making sure you're using the right application of the foam for the hazard that's that's on fire. Mark, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit to the audience about what the difference is in terms of designing firefighting foams that are meant for plunging into the fuel versus what a lot of the municipal fire departments might see, which is not fuel in depth and probably like spill fires. So there, there's a big difference between fighting a spill fire and a fuel in depth. Spill fire, you're going to have less than an inch of fuel there. And as you're applying the foam to the fuel, you're not going to get as much fuel pickup or fuel entrainment in the foam. But when it comes time to do a fuel in depth fire, the depth of fuel could be 20 feet, 30 feet. So having a different application method and also a different product to fight the large fuel and depth fires needed. And, you know, just one thing to point out is that uh, the products that we're developing are designed to pass certain fire tests, not designed for the fire that's going on down the road. Uh, they're designed to meet these specifications. Then you add a safety factor onto that, which gives comfort to the end user in terms of feeling good about extinguishing the fire that they have or could potentially have. I think one of the challenges that you and the other chemists are facing is how do you make the foams uh, shed fuel so that when they're being applied on those surface in those fuel and depth fires that the foam blanket itself is not picking up. And I think that's one of the big challenges for the chemists, the foam blanket getting saturated with fuel because it the workhorse foams that we've had, the AFFFs and the alcohol resistant AFFFs, we're very good at shedding oil, so oleophobic. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. The way the foams are designed right now are pretty different than the, how they were designed when we were able to use uh, fluorinated surfactants or fluorinated polymers. With the fluorinated surfactants or polymers, we had the oleophobicity that you were just talking about, Craig, which doesn't allow the fuel to wick up between the bubbles and to cover the bubbles. What we're looking at now is the idea of making very stable foam. Uh, so foam that could have drain times in the hours. What we're doing with that is we're making that and putting it on the fuel surface and that very stable foam is able to suppress the vapors and prevent any bleed through in terms of little flare ups. Mark, what are, what's the difference in designing a foam for the aircraft rescue firefighting or what we like to call the ARF segment? It may or may not be fuel in depth, but the fire test standards are driving performance that's really difficult to meet. So any difference in your thought process when you're designing those types of foams? Right now, the way I look at it is there are basically two standards that are followed for aviation firefighting. There's the ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, and the MILSPEC. The key differences between those two standards are the ICAO uses a kerosene-based fuel, so Jet A or Jet A1, while the mill spec uses an alcohol-free gasoline. In terms of difficulty of firefighting, you can also look at vapor pressure. So that of the gasoline is quite a bit different than of kerosene. The fire tests, for example, the IKO has three levels, an A, B, and C, with the level C being the biggest fire, and that fire is around 75 square feet. 
The mil spec has two fire tests, the largest being 50 square feet, but you also have to test it in different mix ratios. You test it as the standard concentrate of a 3% or half strength at 1.5% or five times strength at 15%. Uh, You have to do compatibility with dry chemical. You have to look at age concentrate. You have to look at age solution. So there's a lot of different tests that are involved with the mill spec. But over the next few months, you know, the industry is working with the government and government officials on creating a fluorine-free mill spec option for land-based applications. Hopefully by the end of the year, there's a standard that's been published and manufacturers are able to design a product to pass that new standard. That's so important for everybody to understand that As you had mentioned before, we design foams to meet fire test standards. And of course, we're all eagerly awaiting the next mill spec. We focused a lot today really on emergency response, whether it's fuel in depth or non-fuel in depth or a spill fire. Wanted to take a little time to talk about the difference in the design of foams that meet the fixed foam system applications. For example, like sprinklers and, and monitors and other discharge devices where, you know, the expansion ratio really is limited by that discharge device. Maybe you could walk us through some of the challenges in the chemistry. And it's a little different, right? There's, especially in a sprinkler test, there are certain protocols where it has to be resistant to water deluge post-extinguishment. I thought maybe you could touch on that for us. The fixed foam systems are a little bit easier to manage than the industrial rapid response firefighting that, say, U.S. Fire Pump does. The fixed foam systems, we know what the hazard is, the size of the containment, so a system can be designed to NFPA standards with the safety factor on there can give you good fire protection. The big challenge that we have switching over from fluorinated to fluorine-free products has been in the sprinkler application. Our Solberg RF3 has worked really well over the last 10 years on hydrocarbon fuels. Problem has been is finding an alcohol resistant product that also works on hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, The fire tests are are a little bit different between a hydrocarbon fire and a polar solvent fire when it comes in terms of a a sprinkler fire test. The hydrocarbon fuels, they're tested with a five minute solution application followed by five minutes of water like you mentioned, Craig. And what we saw in developing these products is that most of the time when the foam solution was able to hold up and the foam bubbles were able to hold up to that water deluge portion of the test, we were able to pass the rest of the test. The biggest hurdle out there is getting a product that can make it through that water deluge. I'm a little bit different with a polar solvent because if you do that water application after the foam application, you're going to dilute the fuel out enough and potentially render it non-flammable. The tests are a little bit different, but in terms of building a very stable foam blanket on a hydrocarbon fuel is important. And then also on polar solvents is having a foam blanket that's able to hold up for the wait period um, between the end of the application and the start of the burn back. As you're well aware, we recently launched a new Solberg VersaGuard 1x3 fluorine free foam. This is the first one on the market. And this is true of fluorinated products as well, right? Not every foam is designed for every fuel type. Our new 1x3 is really targeted at crude oil and has efficacy on other fuels. But just thought maybe you could provide us a little overview of, you know, those kind of challenges and Just to let the audience know, just because a particular foam passes a particular fire test standard doesn't mean that it's good for every fuel. So what should end users and customers be thinking about? The 1x3 is a big step for us as a leader in fluorine-free technology. We have some really, really talented people on our R&D teams in Asturias, Spain and Green Bay, Wisconsin that continue to push the envelope in terms of technology. The VersaGuard 1x3 product being designed to work well on a more crude fuel, that's something that we're going to want to uh, kind of focus our ideas on and thoughts on is developing that product out a little bit more so we're able to feel a little bit better about the application of that product on other fuels. Because when it comes time to develop fluorine-free foams, 
the surfactants that are used and the materials that are used might need to be different based on the fuel or the hazard that uh, the end user has. Coming up with the right mixture of surfactants, because the difference could be having a raw material in there at 5% instead of 4% makes the world a difference. But when you look at the big picture of a formulation, you have anywhere from, say, 6 to 20 raw materials, ranging from 0.1% or lower up to 20% or higher. Coming across a formulation that is able to work on all the fuels, along with being stable long term, is a very difficult thing. And the possibilities that you could have for formulations are, are in the trillions. Finding a formulation out there that's able to you know, work on the crude fuel along with some other fuels that have maybe a little bit higher vapor pressure is going to be difficult. But uh, I believe that the group that we have is more than capable to uh, overcome that. As you're well aware, we are eagerly awaiting the new mill spec for firefighting foams. You briefly touched on the challenges from a chemistry standpoint, but what kind of impact is this going to have on the overall market when the transition occurs from fluorinated products to fluorine-free? And what are we doing at Perimeter to meet the needs of this next generation of foam? The transition out of the fluorinated product to the fluorine-free product with the government and the mill spec that the government uses as their firefighting foam specification is going to be huge because there are a lot of areas out there that require a mill spec approved foam. Any sort of hangar that has a government aircraft land there has to have that product. Having something that we're able to substitute for what's currently out there would be huge for the industry. And there are some organizations out there that are kind of waiting to see what the government does and what they put out and uh, their specifications for what they have at their facility might change based on what's released. I think that's going to be a very big opportunity for us to go in there and explain our technology and explain the products that we've developed and how they work as that transition time comes. We know that the Department of Defense is looking to make this change. Do you see this filtering down to other organizations like the FAA and potentially the commercial airport? world. Yep, I do. I do. I, I see that uh, we've kind of seen it over the last year or so where some organizations are kind of waiting. They're just waiting to see what the government puts out because maybe they don't feel as comfortable as another person for saying, yep, yeah, let's take this different specification product. For example, the IKO fire test standard, let's use that instead of the mill spec. Then there's going to be some pushback on both sides. One is the technology good enough to be a, you know, quote unquote, drop in replacement. On the other side of that, I guess, is if I continue to use this fluorinated product, what sort of environmental issues am I going to have to deal with if there is a response that's needed? It's definitely evident that the changes are coming and uh, we will be prepared to meet those challenges. When you think five years out from now, what are some of the challenges that chemists face with the next generation of fluorine-free foam products? In five years, kind of what I see is I see all fluorine-free products. Um, I, I see the environmental side taking over and uh, making sure that the fluorine products are not used anymore. Uh, I see in terms of formulation development, I see freeze-protected products. Right now, it's kind of difficult based on the technology being pretty new and the loading level of some of the materials that are in there, getting enough of the uh, free suppression material in there is kind of difficult. So I see us being able to optimize surfactant ratios and polymer ratios and solvents to allow a freeze protected product. And big thing that's going to happen in the next five years is going to be improvement on the listings and approvals that are out there with current flooring free technology and currently listed and approved products because that need is there for the end users. So they're going to want to have a product that has the foam chambers, the foam makers, sprinkler heads, any sort of end-of-the-line discharge device they could think of. It's really going to be fleshing those out and getting a full, more rounded listing with the products that we have in our portfolio. A lot of what I've heard in the market is, what about the next generation products addressing saltwater compatibility and viscosities, because as we know, with the addition of polymers to get performance, a lot of the fluorine-free foam products are a little more viscous. So what are, what are your thoughts there? That's 
one thing we've worked on in developing the latest products that we've we've developed is that we test to make sure that there's uh, compatibility with salt water because we've heard, like you said, from the market is that, well, what about salt water? Well, we're going to try to solve that right up front before the product's release is that, hey, here's a product has fresh and salt water listings and approvals. That's going to be a, a big thing for us there. Uh, viscosity, that's something we're learning every day on how to control. When I talked about the talented people in the R&D group, they've been able to manipulate a few things and get viscosities in a range that are acceptable for pump proportioners and standard ratio controllers and, and anything to proportion the foam concentrates. It's really learning more about how to formulate and also coming across some of the right raw materials to use to formulate to get the performance both on the fire and also proportioning. To find out how we use our experience, responsibility, and integrity to deliver trusted solutions that help improve firefighting performance, visit our website at perimeter-solutions.com. That's perimeter-solutions.com. And learn more about our solutions that save property, natural resources, critical infrastructure, and lives. Please join us again for another episode of Solutions That Save, a fire safety podcast from Perimeter Solutions.